back. Um, any new news? From anyone? Job prospects, internships, questions? Business ideas. Something you thought about recently. Something you read about in business. Oh, All right, objective statements. Who's ready to come up here and tell us a little bit about their objectives? What do they hope to? Look for everybody has their objective statements, I take it. Prepared? No? Yeah. Not at all? How about you? Do you have since you already know a business you're looking into? I haven't really like dive deep into it all yet, but have it just like give you just like making sales and like getting people into the restaurant getting like the name out there is gonna be the main thing like get the standing structure would be like the first goal of the restaurant. Okay, so that's like your first major mm -hmm. objective. Any ideas about how you kinda kinda model that? Not yet, no. Or represent that. Okay. Who else? Yes. I guess from my what I wrote would be to obtain a competitive market share uh, through our value of selling um, apparel made out of recycled textiles. Okay, but what are you kind of how are you going to gauge that? Like, what do you expect to like model or represent? So kind of figure that out. We're uh, my plan is to gauge it basically on sales and compare that to like the top companies in the market, okay. like Nike, Adidas, those are the top two, and the aim, I guess, is to fill in that, like, third place spot, because yeah. I guess that's the most competitive one between, like, Nike, Puma, or, I mean, between Puma, New Balance, and a couple other brands. Okay. Now, do you think that there are some smaller brands that might be, be more effective to compare to? Like, have you looked into more kind of startup brands? as opposed to the more established ones? Um, I haven't looked into like startup brands, but just gauging from like the current atmosphere of the market, I guess you could compare primarily, at the beginning at least, to New Balance, Under Armour. Mm -hmm. They're established, but they're not like so far out of reach, like Nike and Adidas, where they're, Nike and Adidas have like 80% of the market share, like combined and the rest of the 20 is split uh, across like five companies that really have like a place in the market. Okay. Um, who else? Yeah. Um, so my idea was uh, like a curated thrift store where we go out and find <coughs> the vintage products and people come in and then what makes a difference is that we what, have- What kind of, uh, so a vintage store, <coughs> what kind of vintage items are we talking like artwork, furniture, clothes? Clothes. Yeah. Okay, so are you doing cons consignment or are you doing um, kind of resale? Uh, like both. Okay. 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 Yeah, you know, cons consignment would be like basically you would give a cut to the people bringing in the clothes. Right, oh. Bringing in clothing to sell for them, it could be vintage sure. or really maybe high scale, like unique items, and yeah. give them a cut. Or are you more just <clears throat> like a, a thrift store? So I think we would have um, people go out and go to like the thrift stores and get the like the good ones that they have that we can resell. But then people could also come in with their old clothes and try right. it, and then like sell for either. So how, what have you thought about like, what is your your main objective? Is it like? So that um, when they come in to buy whatever they want, I would like to have like a, a customization process where we do have uh, like a, a single head of screen print um, option in the store where 
they can bring in their own images and choose from like some preset ones that we have or even uh, like an embroidery machine. So they can uh, customize them. So they can personalize. Mm -hmm. So they can buy the item there and also personalize it to make it something they, in which case you'll charge them extra mm -hmm. for. Okay. That's interesting. I think that's, I haven't really heard of that one. Now you think about it, actually one of the easiest businesses to start is the thrift store. Very few that are dropping off clothing, okay? So you have, you know, cost of goods sold is pretty low for that. You know, you just want to maintain a building, have an aesthetic, get uh, <clears throat> all the systems in place for like theft, whatever, but yeah, I know a lot of people started some successful ones, uh, like Plato's Closet. Um, um, and obviously you get the bigger ones like Salvation Army, Goodwill, things like that, so. Yeah, great, okay. I like that one. <clears throat> Very feasible. So I don't know if that, is that like a, a, you plan on doing that yourself? Like a real business or is it just, um, class project. Well, as of right now, it'd be a class project, but I mean, as I get older, I think there's more time. If that's something I could do, that'd be pretty cool. Yeah. Who else? A few people just that haven't spoke just about, okay, just your ideas. There's a few of you back there who haven't said your idea. What, what is just your general idea, your proposition? Let's start with you right here. Uh, yeah, I was gonna do a furniture movie or something. Okay. Um, kind of like for any kind of area, whether it's like some like a rural area, uh, city, just kind of seeing like where I'm at. Okay. Now, you, have you thought about scale? You're like, hey, you know, we're initially starting off with one truck, two trucks, you know, two um, guys per truck, three guys, four. Probably like two, like probably like a small business. Prospect or is this something you just go on? Okay. Yeah, moving companies, you see a lot of different ones, right? You know, they, they had pop up all the time. Very hard, very hard, you know, for insurance. People get injured all the time. My dad actually owned a moving company and a storage company here uh, in Chicago for a long time. Um, and what he would do, like his biggest accounts was working with all the thrift stores. So thrift stores would have uh, articles of furniture and clothing picked up from people and dropped off. So they need somebody to move the stuff. So, you know, maybe even consider that like as a major um, demand portion, right? Yeah, like I, I just try to base around like whatever the high demand, like you know, like maybe like a town where there's a lot of like older people, so some are like, Yeah, I definitely think uh, <clears throat> like your target audience is key because you say, hey, we just stay in the suburbs upscale. That way we know people have the money to pay for large scale moving operations and they're not gonna move it themselves like here in Chicago because they just rent a U haul and just move their apartment out and stuff like that, right? So that's important. Difficult business. Um, yeah, my dad hit, hit that, but it was some of a cover up too. Yeah, my dad, like, my dad's an Italian, so um, we had a lot of Sicilian mafia connections, so uh, I grew up with, surrounded by a lot of bad, bad influences and things like that. But yeah, that was one of his operations that he had growing up. Um, who else? So, I've sold shoes for quite a while now, and I think I would open a shop in my city downtown in Rockford, Illinois. Uh, there's a sports facility nearby where a bunch of young athletes and adults show up. There's tournaments there almost every weekend, so it'd be pretty cool. We also have like every Friday, there's like a city gathering where they have like sell food and stuff like literally downtown. So I would sell mainly shoes, definitely some clothes because I'm into that as well. So not 
fully based on clothes, but mainly shoes. And then I've always had the idea to have like a couple like small studio booths where people can come and make music, book sessions, and kind of like a hangout shop because we don't really have that anymore, where somebody can come and play some records and stuff like that. What's, what do you like foresee being the biggest like obstacle? Biggest obstacle I think would probably be people going in there and actually booking those sessions and honestly I think it's just like the audience and being downtown in the city where people I guess don't really see that type of stuff so kind of shy away from trying it out and going and checking it out. Yeah. So think about that like you get into a business that's high variability can't really foresee like a lot of the demand, right? Mm -hmm. So I think it's kind of a wait and see type of operation before you build the demand. Yeah. You know, so it's something to consider. Which is, I'm not saying that it's anything, it's anything bad, you know, there's a need for all businesses, right? But just think of just that variability. You can't really foresee how many people can come in for this, for that. Because that type of uh, experience, people can, a lot, you have a lot of casual, Lookers, right? Yeah. Like window shoppers, you exactly. guys coming in. And so I think definitely marketing would be a big part of it. Yeah. To get people to come in. Yeah, out. that's probably your major, your major one is marketing. Right. Try to create. All right, good. How about you? Uh, my idea was like an online tutoring service where you can like go on the website and you can So how would you, your differentiation is 
I mean, I think that's great. I mean, think about your marketing, right? Your advertisement could be, are you tired of men gawking at you at the, you know, at the workout thing? Like, women may feel uncomfortable. And there's probably a group of women that are like, hey, that's a good idea. I want to go there so I can feel just more comfortable. What's your major obstacle or challenge you perceive? Think about it, if you observing LA Fitness, right, tech store, right, that's a ton of variability. There's times where people are not in those places. Most people may not use certain equipment or certain things. How do you schedule the personal trainers? How much are you paying them? You know, um, how do you keep them? Because if they're not getting a demand for work there, they'll look ugly for other jobs or stuff like that. So a lot of variability too, and that's why you see not too many, you know, uh, workout facilities competing with, you know, the larger scale ones. It's really, really hard. Because you think of the amount of space needed for all the equipment, the equipment, and then all the extra stuff you're talking about has very cost, like initial cost is very, very costly. Okay, great. Uh, did you speak about yours? No, so what I wanted to do was I wanted to open my own baseball training uh, program. Mm -hmm. Instead of building a facility, because everyone has a facility in these days, I was working on implementing all different kind of training methods because in baseball, there's, especially for pitching, there's all kinds of different techniques and pitching methods and all that stuff out there. And I want to incorporate, I would like to incorporate the best of all of those so that way instead of you know, no, my way is the right way. Mm -hmm. I get to incorporate all the methods mm -hmm. and I'll program it. I'll try to partner with a, you know, a pre-established facility, such as the BoJack and they'll have access to weight room so I can get back on the weight training program. And the whole objective would just to be to get guys to play the next level, to keep playing as long as they want. And uh, a realistic objective was, would be to get pro players to come out and compete. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay, so what's the major challenge? Is it the major challenge would probably be partnering with the facility and getting the space to actually do it. Mm -hmm. um, but because then the alternative would be making my own facility, but that's the challenge within itself because that would be more money than just partnering with a pre established facility. Okay, and how many people would you see as trainers, like operators? So I'd probably try to take on like me and then maybe two more guys. That just right. help make sure you know people are doing the right things the right way. It, it, it's going to be a pretty hands-off experience because um, most people have already are somewhat familiar, uh, or they're somewhat familiar with the training methods we will be using. Mm -hmm. uh, just because of like they're in the they're in the new type of ice zone, especially for baseball players. Okay. There won't have to be much. To Are you with the program, right? You're talking about program, so you're talking about all these different methods, pitching, pitching styles, strategies. Are you gonna sort of create your own? Yeah, yeah, so incorporate like, incorporating the best of what's already out there because a lot of the main issue in today's uh, world of baseball, especially training, is that one business will be like, our way is the best way, and their way, their way is no, don't even bother. Right. Yeah. Even though there, the other person's uh, you know method or whatever might ha actually have some merit. Yeah. But it's just you know uh, you know it's my way or the highway type uh, situation in the baseball training world. Mm -hmm. And why you know why do that to yourself when all that when you can use all when you use the best of all all the resources that are out there. Okay. And so you're I mean you will have a method where you like register. Patent that method, like this is, we call it this method, 
we register patent this method, but no one can come and replicate this method, which encompasses all methods. Yeah, I mean, like, do you find it to be the thing where that could generate a lot of sales or revenue? Yeah, because the, the, I mean, there's facilities all over the place, but the thing that's lacking is a facility in Chicago. Okay. Especially the one that has these kind of training. Mm -hmm. A lot of those facilities are in Arizona, California, Texas. The closest one would probably be Indianapolis. Okay. So I think the biggest, I wouldn't be too concerned because, you know, anyone could go out, buy these parts themselves, and train on their yeah. own. Yeah. But having a space to do it with other people, especially college guys and pro guys, mm -hmm. that's going to be the main selling point. Okay. That's why the main objective is to get pro players to kind of build that. That sponsorship. Yeah. Right. And that's fine. I mean, and think about it, you could sponsor with the universities, you could sponsor with professional. So then it would be it would be hard to be pat to patent something like that because I know you wouldn't do it. Yeah. But it's just because of the location and kind of building that name recognition for okay. the program. And don't sell yourself short and anybody can do it. Everybody can do it. But we see that people come up with names because people like new yeah. just like the sound of something. So as a marketing ploy, people always come up with this is our incorporated method for what we do. And you're like, oh, just take the stuff and mush it all together, make one. That's besides the point. The point is now you have something that stays consistent for marketing. It's like creating a new martial art form. Like, it's the same as jujitsu or whatever, besides the point. The point is, it's gonna anchor people to remember this thing and say it's new, right? Because people love innovation. And so as we talk about innovation, it's like, yeah, you're just taking them, all of these and incorporating them, but still you have to create something consistent in the minds and perception of your customer. You know? So if you may, you know, however you want to do it, do it. But if you may want to consider like creating a branding scheme with a name or tagline of like what it comes to. Um, all right, excellent sports, tutoring, education, cafes, wrestling. Um, you say your idea? Yeah, yeah, um, I did have a story. So, um, I want to create um, a design of a brand that's called the Design Furniture. Um, we like recycle resources like this is like the wood, plastic, and beyond. And so what we like different from the other brands is to be a recycled part and also like a, a high quality and a high um, design. Mm -hmm. And yeah, basically, because I would like us to have a good impact on the environment. And I think that the consumer so I think I can like put design and um, the environment together and like use both to very different ends. So yeah. Well, it's like your target audience. Are you going for like high skill sort of pricing comparing? Yeah, I want like I, I think it would be like a high price, and I want like to set up in Europe, and they like make a big use of it, like Paris and like big big in developing where there is a lot of. Um, demand and also as it's a big city um, there is like richer people like in other places yeah. Good tool. Yeah. all right what's the uh okay so green marketing right you want to market in a green sense right you want to play on the hearts and strings of all the people that want to save the planet and do good right um what, what are your other major challenges you um, just like to make you to get to get you know my, like the brain um, and also to collect all the resources because I I would like to do some research to learn how like the can I like transform the plastic and then make it into like a real furniture. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I mean, but 
there is a, a lot of confusion because um, there is already like high design furniture but not like recycled design furniture so mm -hmm. I think it will not be new because there is a huge market but still not that much so I think there is not like a lot of confusion but just like to know by the end this is like a green shadow so all the type of recycled material, okay? Yeah. Not just plastic, like gentlemen. Yeah, no. Exactly, which is great. So uh, you think of that, so retail, fashion, whatever. Now with all these ideas you guys have, think of when we talk about like value, like think of the power of brand. Yes, you have operations. Yes, your doors are open. Yes, you're selling something. But is there some power in your brand like the other brand? You get what I'm saying? And that was makes the actual work, you know, the value of like Nike, you know, Adidas, all these things. So it's power and branding. You have to create an idea. So that's what I'm saying. Like even in the perception of consumers, they need to identify specifically that that is that thing. So it can't be too broad. It has to be like this is our image. This is what we represent. That sticks with people. If not, people forget. You know, forget all the time and just move on to other products. Who else? Yeah, so, I don't know if you've ever seen like a, a medieval so the fighting sport game. It's like a game where people beat each other in armor. I think the, like, it's a pretty niche uh, kind of sport. And, it's, and there's a pretty high uh, buyer of entry with the price of the equipment. And you, you got to buy a full set of armor, so it's like 100. Uh, uh, hundreds or thousands for each piece uh, to pay uh, for a price and like you get to have like 10 or 20 pieces for just a set so it's a really expensive uh, things to get into mm -hmm. and uh, there's not uh, there's no est established brand uh, to help you getting into it so you get to buy a mix of uh, part of the equipment you find everywhere on the internet and it's not very big enough friendly. So the idea would be to create a brand that uh, helps people get into it at a reasonable price and with a good guarantee of quality. So, uh, so uh, it would uh, expand the market for the sport because people would, be, would come into it more easily. Mm -hmm. And also, people who have more confidence in uh, the product they buy because, like, they already bought one, they know that it's quality. Because almost every shop uh, available is like people selling uh, what they make to a shop who then sells it. And so, it's really hard to get a, a substantial quality every time. You, you don't really know where what you buy came from. Okay, so you want to. Centralize everything into one place and make it simple. By creating something where we produce uh, the equipment mm -hmm. and where we sell it as well, so people know what they, where what they buy came from. Okay. What's um, your biggest challenge? You think? I think one is the market is pretty small and like I find it really hard to find numbers. So it's like. I could find numbers that were anywhere between uh, thousands of people uh, to hundreds of thousands of people in the world. So it's pretty hard to get a really good um, approximation of the market. Yeah. And secondly, it's like getting people to actually make the equipment because if people are single or craftsmen, uh, uh, today, like it's because they value their independence and they don't necessarily want to join a company that that bigger than them, and where they don't have as much control. So, it, I mean, it could be a great thing, right? That that there's nothing like that out there, right? Or it could be an indicator, like, well, why doesn't this already exist, right? But um, so you'll be a first mover, right? So I think if it works out great, then. You know, now you've created a whole entire new market. You have a lot of investors giving you money, banks throwing you a ton of money if it really, really works if it's a first mover. So, yeah, excellent, excellent, you guys. 
All right. Uh, all sounds good for the people who don't have an objective yet, <coughs> like specific objective. Try to get that ready for Friday so we can talk about specifically what your objectives are. Um, all right. Let's continue on with chapter four. Capacity planning. Capacity planning. How do we plan to grow? Right? The companies always want to grow. They don't want to stay making the same revenues each year. They need to grow because things get more expensive over time. You want to increase your profits. There's all sorts of unforeseen circumstances that can happen at any moment. Right? So we're going to talk about how to plan for capacity. Me on a personal level, right? Owning real estate. So you said, Professor Ross, well, what do you got to plan for owning these buildings, right? These big, big uh, large scale apartment buildings, what have you. Well, you said we have to plan to increase the value of the building over time so that people are willing to pay more rent, right? After each lease. So how do you do that? Well, the money you get, the income you get, you can place into some sort of capital reserve. You say, I'm going to take either 15% of all the income or 20% of all the income, and I'm going to reinvest it back in. Why? Because you'll need new boilers, new heating system, uh, plumbing issues, tuck plumbing, inspections, roofing, all these different things to operate a big, large scale building. <coughs> So you have to make uh, built-in cushioning for things that you know to plan for, but also for things that are unforeseen, right? A bad storm, you get a leak, right? Pipes burst, now you gotta bring somebody in. Plumbers get a ton of money to do. Um, all sorts of things can happen. Window cracks, right? So think of it just from that perspective of real estate. You need to build some sort of cushion to plan to either grow the building, right, to make more income with new tenants next year, or for people who re-sign the lease, right, that you're going to up the rent and want to keep them, so they don't say, no, nah, it's too much, I want to move. That's ridiculous. Right, so you want to improve the units, improve the building overall. You have to constantly grow and build in these cushions. That's just one thing, the way to think about this capacity planning. <clears throat> last class about like waiting in line to start with, right because they didn't have enough employees for the surge and demand uh, coffee from 9 30 a.m to 12 a.m right they didn't plan for that capacity if they planned for it they would have somebody on call <clears throat> it means they would change the process and how quickly they're preparing the, the drink this stuff applies production retail all sorts of things we talk about economy of skills this economy of scale, timing, cushions, right? Reserving capacity process uses to handle sudden increases in demand or temporary losses in production capacity. We say you have your average utilization rate. Under normal conditions, how much of whatever you're producing can you produce based on machines that you have or the people that are producing those things? So we say, okay. <clears throat> So we say capacity cushion would be 100% minus the average utilization rate. If you, on average, we say hotels only have utilization rate of 60% because the other 40% of the time there's vacant rooms, right? They always have vacant rooms. We can say, well, their capacity cushion will vary. Uh, we can say here hotels can live with 30 to 40% uh, cushion, whereas capital intensive, like production, Right, making Coca-Cola on assembly line, you don't have that luxury <clears throat> because you need to meet the demand. So your cushions would be well under 10% of what you can allow. So here's some strategies. This is the expansionist strategy, right? You're always prepping to expand. You're always over, uh, overshooting, I would say. <clears throat> I mean, 
y-axis, you have your capacity. On your x-axis, you've got time. And here's your uh, increments over time for capacity. So here's your planned unused capacity. You're not going to use this in any normal setting, right? So you're having too much capacity just in case. But for all the fluctuations that happen along this uh, trajectory, you're going to meet the demand. Right? You're going to make money. Right? You're not going to have any reason why you wouldn't be able to take care of those customers or produce that certain product. <coughs> But at the same time, he's like, well, I don't know about that strategy. This seems like it'd be wasteful because what happens in times where um, you don't get that much demand, right? And he's like, well, that's a waste. We're, we're spending money for things that may not happen. So it really depends on the market or industry that you're in, in which case you would use this strategy, right? So if it increases, you keep increasing also your plan unused capacity. Now here is a second strategy, right? Call it the wait and see. Let's wait and see what happens before we spend all this money to, to hire more people, right? Maybe we get too many people that are not doing anything. Idle time when customers aren't around. Um, or we're just producing something maybe randomly that we can't really do a good measure on what the demand would be. And so we say, hey, we lower our capacity. Right? How much do I have lower? If it goes up, unfortunately, we can't service these people. We may lose money, but at least we won't waste. So we keep our waste down, right? So think about this even with your ideas. Like what is the strategy you're gonna be using? Are you gonna have a lot of stuff in reserve? You know, a lot of employees on hand, um, or are you gonna kind of wait and see? And say, I'm gonna let the market kind of dictate my next move first. But at the same time, that means you could potentially be losing a lot of customers. I'll wait and see, right? Now, I always think it's best to, it really depends on the market, but I always think it's best to have more than a half. Right? It's always good to have more than half a load up because you can always get rid of the more in some capacity. Right? You can always do something with the, with the inventory, with the people, right? you know, lay them off or put them part time, things of that nature. But if you don't have the people when the demand is actually there, then you're not going to service those. Which strategy you think would be best for your businesses? You find that like, hey, I'm going in hard. I want to have as much money and capital to have everything laid out first so I can build that demand. Or I'm going to go step by step. I'm not going to put too much capital in first. I'm going to wait to see how people react to this idea. And then I'll try to search out to kind of hire more people get more equipment, all of the above. Anybody? Yeah. I'd say for my business, um, because it's pretty much an entertainment uh, business, um, way to see method might be better, because uh, the product is not just something you can produce and package. The product is something you're delivering essentially in real time, more or less. and um, especially for a live crowd, that's where you get your reaction for if the audience likes it or not, they're engaged or not. And I think um, before going all in on, say, a storyline or uh, a certain guy, or even produce, finding <coughs> maybe whose merchandise is going to get promoted more, um, I think the audience in the end would really uh, somewhat tell uh, yeah. what's successful and what's not. Okay. Absolutely. I mean, I, <clears throat> it may be a good strategy for that because that's a tricky one, right? You don't know how many people are coming in for entertainment or that new type of innovative entertainment you're talking about. 
think of even retail, right? You'd be like, man, they, they have a lot of stuff here. They, they don't sell much. Whereas other retailers be like, um, we're scarce on this clothing. It costs 1500 but not anybody can get it, right? We only have three extra larges, three larges. In other places, we got a million, right? You could buy as much as you want. And so you're like, well, are they, their strategy, do they factor in loss? Because they know they have too much stuff to begin with, right? So you go in these clothing stores, you're like, what do they do with these clothes? These are the same clothes that's been here forever, right? You say like, oh, they're gonna put them on clearance or I don't know, give them to the thrift stores or something. Like that. Do they factor in as part of their strategy? Like, hey, we just take this as a loss, right? We just, we wanna have enough to service everybody, but we know we're not gonna get rid of all this stuff. So it's also almost like, how do you kind of factor in waste? You know, then you almost need a new strategy for waste. Like, oh, it's on sale, $42. It's good, so. Oh, okay, it's on clearance for $3, right? At what point did you make money in that process with that inventory? Anybody um, <clears throat> else besides like a wait and see? Yes. Um, I, I think for my company, it would have to be a combination of both. At the beginning, obviously, it is capital intensive to set up the factories and manufacturing of the products and getting the textiles from the recycled materials. But I'd, I'd use the wait and see method at the beginning to gauge like demand and popularity. And then I'd have a metric to like decide, okay, this we've reached this amount of sales and demand is only going up. This is where we're gonna hammer home or like invest a lot into creating extra stock or additional capacity because we know that there is a demand, there is a market for this type of product. Excellent. So you want to be highly efficient in kind of how you run this operation. Yeah, think about it, it's just different styles and how people manage, right? So you can see it all over. You can see a business, there's new stores that pop up, you're like, this is way too big for how many people that come in here, right? Or you see very small scale, you know, like they got it just right for the amount of people that actually come into this place, right? So think about that. Just different styles of uh, people's ideas on how they scale things in their mind. Because you have really no idea how people are gonna respond to it when it's a new idea, right? <clears throat> All right, so we talked about long-term capacity decisions. Estimate future capacity requirements, so you can do this. We'll look at decision trees and other mathematical models. Um, identifying gaps cut by comparing requirements with available capacity, develop alternative plans for reducing the gaps. So constant efficiency, looking at the gaps between uh, capacity and actual requirements. <clears throat> Evaluate each alternative both qualitatively and quantitatively and make final choices. What are some quantitative, well, what are some qualitative uh, evaluations you think before making like a choice here? what you should do. What are some qualitative capacity decisions? Yeah. You could, I guess, look at customer reviews if you're selling a product or a service and see how they're responding to it, if they're liking it then you just kind of continue what you're doing now and then I guess scale up or if they're not liking it or if you're getting bad reviews, you have kind of have to get to the source of what exactly is making customers mm -hmm. think is bad about the product or service and then you kind of have to change that before you can start thinking about increasing capacity or. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, consumer views, right? It's not really a uh, finite measurement you can take on the onset, right? So it means quality something you can actually measure right then and there. What about quantitative? What are some quantitative items <clears throat> that you can evaluate? I'm not sure that this would fit well, but say like action figures or trading cards. I know people collect them and there can be like value in them. And especially if there is say a special variant, a limited edition variant. So that in itself kind of makes it more value valuable to people 
uh, to collect them because um, of the scarcity of the special edition variant. Okay. So maybe how much you have a yeah. sort of a, yeah. a scarce product or something like that. So kind of like more, make it <coughs> more of a creative <coughs> version or rare version. Okay, so think about it. Just logical perspective. You want to reduce the gaps between what you actually can produce and what actually you need to do, right? Simply, what's the quantitative one? The people, the employees. You can clearly see how many people you have. You pay them X amount of dollars. They're not fulfilling a demand, and they have to get rid of that. Right? You can measure that monetarily right on the onset. You can see the machines. You can say I have too many machines. Right? Something you can measure right then and there. So people, machines, anything in the production process of anything, right? That you're providing. You can come up with those measurements. Now you come up with a new decision. Uh, any questions before we go? All right, everyone, you enjoy your day. See you on Friday.